So I, I was talking to an MIT school buddy a, a couple of years ago over at CES in Vegas, uh, where IBM was uh, demonstrating uh, some of their quantum uh, computing technologies. And he basically told me that there will be a world, a BQC before quantum computing and AQC after quantum computing. And maybe some of us will live in that, in that kind of transition period. Um, and uh, so staying on this revolutionary topic, uh, we continue with John Chavarini, who's senior staff member in the Quantum Information and Integrated Nanosystems Group at MIT Lincoln Laboratories. And John's presentation is Integrated Technologies for Trapped Ion Quantum Computing. So John, please. All right, thanks very much. Um, so uh, it's hard to go after Will, but uh, he did give a really good uh, comprehensive and, and um, concise view of quantum computing. And he talked about a few of the different methodologies uh, to do that kind of quantum computing and what we think we can develop in the near term and eventually hopefully the long term to realize some of the promise that quantum computing has. And so I'll be talking about one of those particular modalities, uh, trapped ions, um, as opposed to superconducting qubits that Will works with and the other technologies that he talked about. And this particular technology has a lot of promise because we're dealing in this case with natural qubits. These qubits are based on single atoms. And so one great thing about them is they're all exactly the same. They're all identical. And if we can isolate them very well from the environment, they can provide very good qubits. So let's get into this. So what have trapped ion qubits been able to do uh, in, in, in these days? Let me, sorry, find the uh, laser pointer. There is one, there may be not one on here. So as you can see, uh, it demonstrated, shown here on the slide, there have been a lot of demonstrations with up to 50 uh, ion qubits on the order of 50 ion qubits to do quantum simulations. Quantum computing in a general sense done at several different academic and uh, industrial locations as well as national laboratories to uh, do arbitrary connectivity between a uh, number of qubits so that you can do quantum algorithms where you interact any of the qubits together, uh, which is one of the advantages that you can perform with trapped ions, uh, and very high fidelity gates in these systems. And so academia, national labs, and industry now uh, are developing ion-based uh, quantum technologies to try to make a quantum computer. You can see here uh, HQS is Honeywell Quantum Systems. So Honeywell is in this, it's a big company. And then INQ, as was mentioned by Will, uh, recently uh, taken public uh, with, with a large valuation. So um, the, uh, there is a lot of hope for uh, trapped ions as a quantum computing technology. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, what this technology looks like. Uh, but beyond quantum computing, I wanted to uh, point out one other good uh, potential application for trapped ions which is as, as clocks. And this uh, addresses the uh, quantum sensing modality that uh, Will mentioned, and he talked about navigation, uh, things like that. Uh, currently, the best clock in the world is based on a single aluminum ion, uh, and it's actually you know, held in a trap, as you can see over on the right side, uh, with another ion, which is a magnesium ion, which is actually used to control it. Uh, using some quantum logic techniques. So actually, we're taking um, elements from the nascent quantum computing uh, world and using them for an application in timekeeping. Uh, this, uh, this, this best clock in the world is actually made that way because we used quantum logic to manipulate the aluminum ion, which would otherwise, otherwise be very difficult to attack. And so the, this kind of clock can get uncertainty, which is one part in 10 to the 18, and you can actually see the gravitational redshift due to moving you know, this clock uh, a few centimeters. That's sort of the scale that we're talking about here. So the best clock currently in the world. So this enables not only precision timing, but also you know, basic science, because these uh, atomic sensors are also very sensitive to fields that we are interested in. And things like dark matter, as I'll, I'll maybe discuss briefly later, can be addressed with these kind of systems. So uh, beyond quantum computing, there may be other applications. Uh, but I'll focus mostly on quantum computing here. I'll talk about tracked ions as qubits and then describe some of the integrated technologies that we're developing that we think are going to be required to get to the scale that we need to make this a practical technology. And so I'll start with trapped ions. Uh, and what they are. So what am I talking about here? A trap, what's a trapped ion? So I'm talking about one single atom. 
So here's a sort of a Bohr picture of an atom here. I have a nucleus and I have a bunch of electrons. The important part here is that I have one electron in the outermost shell. I pick an ion, I pick an atom, which I can take an, ion, uh, an electron off, and then I am left with uh, one electron, and that's sort of the, the, the thing that I use to play with as my qubit. So in that state, I call that the zero state. I can promote it to another metastable state, a state which lives for a long, a long amount of time, and that can be the one state. Uh, and as Will described, um, not only can I be in either the zero or the one state, but I can put this electron in a superposition of states. I can put it in essentially both at the same time with some element of both zero and one at the same time. So utilizing these ground states uh, uh, and excited state of the electron around the uh, atom, I can do uh, quantum processing. That forms my qubit. Now I have this atom. What am I going to do with it? It's one atom, right? That's kind of a difficult thing to hold on to. It turns out that there is a, uh, a technology which has been around for a little while which allows you to hold on to charged particles. So if I imagine these, these, uh, these red and gray circles here are rods coming out of the screen, and I apply a field, uh, a voltage to the red ones with respect to the gray ones, I can create a field that with the lines that look something like this. And this, for a positively charged particle, uh, it's trapped in one of these dimensions but anti-trapped in the other. But if I turn uh, that voltage into uh, an RF, a radio frequency voltage, which oscillates, I can actually trap that uh, charged particle such that if it's anti-trapped in one direction, before it gets very far, I switch the field and it gets trapped. And for a particular uh, uh, mass and frequency with which I do that, I can trap the ion you know, indefinitely in those two dimensions. In the third dimension, I can just sort of put on positive voltages of a few volts and trap it in 3D. Uh, and so typically, those kinds of um, uh, trapping technologies have, benefit, have been done in these sort of machined macroscopic techniques, as you can see here from this uh, so-called PAL trap, which is a, sort of a large thing which you machine. Uh, but if we want to think about making this system into something which will scale to many, many qubits, we have to think about a different way to do it. And it turns out that you can shrink and planarize this technology by rotating, essentially, those electrodes into a plane uh, you still get a, the same kind of field, though slightly weaker, uh, above the, the surface of this. But now you can see that this looks like something that you can microfabricate. This is something that I can make on the surface of a chip. And that's actually what's shown over here is a, a typical so-called surface electron linear, a surface electrode linear PAL trap, uh, which we make on, a, on different kinds of substrates, silicon, sapphire, the kind of typical things that you use in, in clean room. And then we define electrodes on this uh, surface of this device such that we can trap ions about 50 microns above the surface. Uh, this is what they look like. Each of these points here is one atom. So each one of those is one strontium atom with one electron ripped off. Uh, and they sit about five microns apart, and they're about 50 microns. So this is you know, 50 millionths of a meter uh, from the surface of that chip. That's what they look like. And so then uh, what do we do? We have that ion, and we manipulate it using laser beams, typically. So I have uh, a couple ions here trapped above a surface chip. Just, this is just a diagram. But I, I already talked about those uh, states 0 and 1, which are the, the qubit levels. I also have some other states in the of that electron. I can move it to different states, some of which decay much faster, but that means I can use them for things like reading out the quantum state or laser cooling the ion so that it gets very cold. Uh, it, do, it turns out that for uh, quantum computers made of trapped ions, you don't necessarily need to keep them at these very low temperatures that you need for superconducting and other technologies. You can do this at room temperature. But the ions themselves are very cold, can get down to similar temperatures or lower temperatures, uh, sub-millikelvin temperatures effectively through laser cooling. So uh, one other key aspect here is how do you do multi-qubit operations. Single qubit operations, I just so I can apply a laser. Multi-qubit operation comes from the fact that these guys are charged. They're both positive, and they share, uh, through the so-called Coulomb interaction, um, they, they repel, essentially. If you trap them now in a trap, so you have the competition between them pushing each other apart and the trap holding them together, you actually have shared interaction. You have shared vibration between the two ions. And by turning, tuning lasers to certain frequencies, you can actually use this vibration to couple quantum information between the two, uh, the two uh, ions, uh, the two ion qubits. And you can create um, multi-qubit operations that way. OK, great. These ions sound pretty cool. Uh, they're very natural. We have a lot of progress, very long coherence times. I didn't really describe, say this yet, but minutes have been demonstrated in these systems, in the quantum systems held in these trapped ions. Um, errors are very low. They can be, we can do operations at the 99.9% .9 fidelity uh, level. We can control 20, 30, 40 qubits. 
Um, and some of the best clocks in the world are based on this technology. However, we don't have a quantum computer that we are using right now to do quantum, like very many quantum ad advantageous algorithms with trap nines and why. Part of it is sort of what's the picture that's looming in the background there. This is a technology that's based a lot on having a lot of laser beams and directing them onto trapped ions that are in vacuum chambers. So I have a whole optical table there just to control maybe one qubit. I have to send laser beams through all these lenses and direct light to the qubits. And so that's a challenge. I'm going to need many more qubits with high fidelity operations. That means I'm going to need individual control beams, individual elect uh, electronics to control the ions that are charged. I can move them around. Uh, I'm probably going to need some more portable, re robust controls. Uh, and so what could I do? So we have a vision for how I can essentially shrink that optical table uh, and that electronics into using uh, digital technology that's been developed over many years to extend into the quantum world and help control trapped ions. And so what might this look like? Um, here you see uh, an animation of what a quantum computer based on trapped ions might look like. I can move the ion by changing voltages on these surface electrode, uh, electrodes. And then lasers can come in through waveguides that are under the surface of the material, hit gratings, which act like lenses, to produce laser beams. And I can move the ions together. And using this Coulomb interaction that I just described, I can perform two qubit gates. Uh, and so then an algorithm running on a quantum computer that's based on an array, arrayed version of this would look something like that. Uh, the algorithm, that wasn't totally random. That would be something like uh, one of these quantum error correction uh, algorithms that Will talked about in his talk is what something like that, like that would look like. Um, and so this is a great vision, but we have a lot to do to get to this vision. Uh, and so I'll describe uh, with the rest of the talk uh, some of the things that we're doing using uh, the, the digital technology that we have today and that we hope to develop in the future, uh, and as well as some quantum engineering techniques uh, to further this uh, and to do more. And so if you look in the background here, you see sort of a, kind of a, a picture of one of these, uh, another depiction of one of these arrays of uh, trapped ion um, uh, electrode structures that can trap ions and move them around and uh, shine lasers on them to do quantum operations. There's a few technologies that we think we're going to need to get this to work. This is a subset of them, which I'll talk about, because I think they're relevant for digital technologies. Uh, um, I'll start with the thing in the upper left, which is talking about having different species of ions. It turns out that we're probably going to have one species of ion that is the quantum uh, information carrier, and the other one is kind of a helper, which helps us cool the ions down without affecting their quantum information, and maybe helps us read out the quantum bits uh, in, that, uh, in that ion without affecting other ions through scattered light. Having a different species means that all the transitions are very far different in frequency, such that they can the other, the computational lines are protected. Um, so starting there, just very briefly say that we have been able to do a lot of operations of very high fidelity, two qubit operations between ions of like species, as you can see over on the left, calcium, calcium, strontium, strontium, as well as interspecies operations between calcium and strontium, and actually something a little bit more complicated where we're using calcium ion to cool the strontium ions, and then we do a two qubit operation on the, on the strontium ions. These kind of things are elements that we think we'll need. Uh, to do this kind of quantum information processing in one of these systems. Now move on to some of the integrated technologies, starting with electronics. I described how the uh, ions are positively charged, and we can hold on to them by putting voltages on you know, electrodes. This means that we can also move them around by changing those voltages. And it turns out that we think that that's going to be a very important aspect of a quantum computer uh, that has, is based on an array of ions. And so one of the things that we've been able to do um, in the last few years is utilize CMOS technology uh, that's used to make microchips like in, in our phones to make integrated electronics that are beneath the electrodes of one of these ion trap chips. It wasn't really clear that this would work. Uh, we've been, you know, usually you have to do a lot of different kinds of microfabrication to work in the quantum world without affecting any of the quantum information, affecting the decoherence, as Will talked about. Uh, but we thought, well, we can get really good electronics uh, using so-called um, complementary metal oxide or CMOS uh, semiconductors. Uh, and so what we tried to do was, OK, let's use the CMOS that we have in the bottom of a silicon chip, or that we can make in the bottom of a silicon chip, and then put the electrode structure on top and then trap the ions. Uh, and I, I won't get into the details here, but we, we made essentially a digital-to-analog converter based on a hybrid low-voltage and high-voltage 
CMOS technology, uh, which would feed voltages directly to those electrodes above to manipulate the ions um, in, in real life. And this, uh, what I'm talking about is something we did a few years ago, but we're also working with Fermilab on next generation integrated electronics that may be useful for quantum computers and quantum clocks uh, and, and uh, optical clocks. So the actual digital analog converter looks like something like this. This is what this is the, the circuit designer sees when he draws it or she draws it, but it's a couple hundred microns on a side. Uh, and that can fit underneath all this stuff. It's pretty small compared to the sort of a few hundred, or it's comparable, I would say, to the few hundred micron size that we're dealing with in an ion trap here. Uh, and so we put um, those structures underneath the electrodes of the ion trap. This was a linear trap that had 16 of these channels of these uh, voltage generators that I can move the ion around with. Um, and what the great thing about that is instead of having to bring all those 16 or however many wires in, now I just have to bring, I essentially have to plug a USB cable into the side of this chip. I can just serially program it. I can digitally program it rather than have to bring in those analog voltages. And I think that's gonna be a game changer for making the system much larger where you're gonna need lots of electrodes, lots of ions, you're gonna to have to move them all separately. And so we were able to essentially just sending in a couple serial control uh, um, wires, trap ions above this, uh, above this trap, and then move it by just serially programming, not having to send in actual voltages, actual analog voltages to, to do anything. And so we can now use an integrated um, digital and analog electronics to have something that's like a CMOS compatible qubit. I mean, the qubit is still this atom that is trapped above, but I can use CMOS digital technology to make some of the devices. Uh, now I'll move on to um, uh, integrated photonics. Uh, that is how do I bring lasers uh, to control the ion in a chip-based technology like what I'm talking about. So one of the big challenges you might see if you're just, you know, okay, that doesn't look like a computer to me. That looks like a physics experiment. I have mirrors all over the place. I have lenses all over the place. Uh, and I'm sending light into a vacuum chamber. That's what we're showing here, up here on the left side. Uh, and there uh, are a lot of challenges when you do that, especially the first and foremost is, okay, if I have all those laser beams for one ion and I want like many, then am I just gonna have to multiply that? That seems like a, you know, a nightmare. I mean, turn all those knobs. Uh, it also turns out that I'm sending in light through uh, what's known as free space. I'm just sending it through the air and then into these windows. Uh, and so uh, it has long lever arm, so if something happens to that mirror, the beam does, all, does something crazy like this. Uh, it's also subject to acoustic thermal and airflow perturbations, uh, which are you know, something which are somewhat beyond our control and something that we wouldn't want to have to deal with. You have to do more error correction if you have to deal with something like that, if, if you can even get to the threshold, as Will was describing. Chip integrated optics can eliminate many of these shortcomings. So by having waveguides, which are essentially like fiber optics in a chip, which I fabricate at the same time as I make the chip and with the same uh, resolution, uh, then I can route light around the chip just underneath the array. And then if I hit one of these grading based structures, light can come out of the chip and uh, address the ion and do a quantum operation. And so there's, these are very stable on-chip beam paths. The final optic is only you know, very, you know, 100 microns from the, from the ion, so I don't have a long lever arm. And it's in the vacuum because I keep these ions in a vacuum. And so this should be able to enable uh, addressing larger arrays of ions. Uh, these uh, so-called grading couplers, which are like lenses, uh, work by essentially taking that waveguide material and at the end of the waveguide, so this is, the, I should just take one step back and say that the waveguide is essentially a higher index core around a lower index cladding, just like you have in an optical fiber. But in this case, I can pattern it in a chip. Uh, and then I, I break that waveguide up into a grating, a periodic structure, which when light hits it, much like if you see, uh, people maybe don't use CDs anymore, but you might remember, if you look at a CD, you can kind of see a uh, rainbow if, you, if you're shining white light on it. That's because the, the structures there are very small and you essentially create a grating which, which acts like a, a prism which sends different frequencies of light in different directions. This is a very similar kind of thing. We're creating a grating which is tailored for a particular wavelength. Light comes down, hits that grating, uh, and then is scattered out and I can then tailor a Gaussian beam much like the multiple beams that you see in the picture on the right here, the uh, illustration where I'm sending several different colors of light up to uh, an ion trapped above the surface. Uh, and then uh, this provides uh, a very nice, you know, it's, it's an optic, doesn't look like one, I don't have to grind it, it's not glass. 
Uh, it is glass, but it's not glass that I have to like grind, you know? It's glass that I can put in a chip. Uh, and so we think this is a nice way to, uh, to direct the light onto ions, and we've then made a chip that was based on this technology, and now what you see here uh, is actual data of uh, what the beams coming out of the chip look like as I, as I look uh, at, at a, um, using a microscope that I'm scanning above the surface. So the light uh, starts out at those gratings, at the, these different colors of light, and as I move up, uh, they converge toward the center while I trap the ion. And in the lower right there, you see a uh, uh, scanning electron microscope image of what the trap looks like at the center. So an ion would be trapped in the center of those squares. Each of those is a window that has one of these grating lenses. Uh, and I can send all these different wavelengths, which are important for the strontium ion, uh, different colors, um, from the blue up to the IR uh, to control the ions. So we made a chip like this. You can couple the light on to the chip with a bunch of fibers into a V-groove array that then couples into the waveguides on the system. Uh, so now it's, I, I made the analogy before, plugging a USB in to uh, get the electronics onto the chip. Now I can just plug sort of a, essentially a fiber optic block in to get the optical signals onto the chip. Uh, and then we put this in our system and uh, we measured um, what we could do. And so here what you see is actually a demonstration of individual ion qubit addressing. So up in the upper right, that's a, picture, that's a real picture of, of five ions trapped in one of these traps. There's about five microns in between each of them. Uh, and the center one is blinking. What's going on there is that I have one of these um, uh, beams delivered via a grading coupler, and it's very well focused down to a few microns close to uh, what's called the diffraction limit for how tight I can get that beam. Uh, and it's focused only on the center ion. And it's using this red light at 674 nanometers that's shown in this diagram here. This is, an, uh, this is a diagram of the states of the ion. And if the ion is in the S state, uh, it's in the zero state of my qubit, or I sh should have labeled these, and the D state is the one state. And so what's actually happening here is that I'm shining that red light on the ion, and every time it goes dark, it's actually going up in that D state, and you don't see the fluorescence from this blue beam that I have on it. So it's actually making quantum jumps uh, by itself uh, because the lifetime of the upper state is on the order of a half a second. Uh, as I shine this light using this focus beam. And this demonstrates um, diffraction limited size for uh, focusing uh, beams on, on an ion. And it also turns out that there is, uh, beyond just being able to focus ions and, and, and uh, focus light on ions and separate uh, light into lots of different locations on a chip, it also turns out that you get an advantage to performance. Uh, this is slightly technical, but just very briefly, if you have vibrations in your system, much as Will talked about in the lacrosse analogy, uh, that can affect the laser beam uh, frequency by pr providing a tiny little bit of Doppler shifts, which change the phase of the light and can change the phase on the qubit. It essentially gets writ on, written onto the qubit, those kind of vibrations. What we showed here is that if you use externally sent, a beam sent in externally um, and the ion is shaking, the ion trap is shaking, you see, you see these vibrations on the qubit decoherence. But if you use an integrated beam delivery system where the, the beam is sent uh, using one of these grading couplers on the chip, everything's moving together. It's a common mode vibration. And what you can see by using um, interferometry, interferometry, interferometry uh, based on the qubit that we can reduce the, um, the effect of that vibration. And what you see on the curve on the right is that uh, with a free space beam, we essentially lose coherence as a function of acceleration of the uh, vibration of this uh, trap, whereas in the blue curve, uh, with the integrated beam, we don't see any loss in coherence as we uh, crank up the vibration of the system. So this can be something that I think will also provide a passive interferometric stability, which can be something that would be very useful for a, a, for a portable platform as well. Um, I'll point out quickly here, beyond, beyond the work that we've shown demonstrating many different uh, wavelengths of light to control a qubit, there have also been recent related work on two qubit gates. And so put together two qubit gates using integrated photonics and all of the different operations that you need using these waveguide delivered beams of light for a qubit really makes it a promising technology. There's still a lot we have to do to, to figure out if this will work in larger systems and deal with things like optical loss and, and things like that, which are different from free space, but it still looks like a very nice way to go. Uh, one other aspect of um, the uh, uh, technologies that we need uh, is how to measure the state of the ion. So 
there are uh, these two different qubit levels that we uh, have the ion in at the end of a computation. As Will showed in the sort of how the computation progresses, at the end you measure uh, the qubits to see what state you're in, and hopefully if the algorithm is written correctly, you end up in one state more than the other. It turns out that for trapped ions, the way that you measure the state, a very efficient way that you can measure the state is by shining laser light of a very particular color, uh, and then you'll see the ion if it's in one state, and that light will not affect the ion if it's in the other state. That's uh, essentially what was shown on the, the movie I showed with the ion blinking. It was going between the zero and the one state. When it's in the one state, it's dark. When it's in the zero state, it's bright. And that's how I do the measurement. That measurement was made by collecting light outside the vacuum chamber in a big lens and shining it on a very sensitive camera. That's a great way to do lab experiments. But if you want to now scale the system to very large um, uh, collections of ions and you, you want to efficiently measure them, we think that you'll need an on-trip technology. And so one of the things we've been working on is integrated single photon detection based on avalanche photodiodes. And so here we've taken uh, and used the lower part of the stack, as I've, I've sort of alluded to before, for the electronics, and we've made, uh, using the silicon, by doping the layers differently, as you can see in the lower right there, we make a, a, a diode structure, PN junction, which is sensitive to single photons. If we bias it correctly, such as that it's in single photon avalanche mode, one photon impinging on the silicon there where I've doped it uh, creates a pulse that I can read out and I can see each individual photon. The great thing about this is if we can make a trap on top of that structure, uh, which we've already sort of demonstrated and I described earlier, now you have a detector that's built in. It's essentially a pixel that's at every trap location. And I can look at the fluorescence from the ion uh, in a local way uh, and what you see in the upper left here is a, a demo trap where we've done that, where we've put an APD underneath the center part of a trap. Uh, we would trap the ion just above the surface of there. Uh, and we've shown that we can trap the ion above there without loss. We bias this thing up to, to several volts, which can affect the ion, but we can trap it. But we can also measure the qubit state with very high fidelity. So over on the right there, you see two histograms. Uh, which are, uh, if the ion is in the bright state or if it's in the dark state, what are the, the how many photons do we get measured on this APD? Uh, and you can see they're very well isolated in a reasonable amount of time. With the overlap of that histo those histograms essentially tells you how good you can measure this quantum state. We can measure it with very high fidelity on the order of 99.9% .9 fidelity, as you see down in the lower right uh, hand corner. We can do it relatively quickly as well, depending on exactly how, what, what information we take away from when the photons arrive and how many, how many come. Uh, and so uh, there are still some other challenges. We need this, this single photon sen sensitivity in the presence of a large voltage that we use to trap the ions. But so far, things are looking pretty good, and they seem to work. I'll point out some related work that's uh, based on integrating other types of detection technologies uh, into ion traps. In this particular case, uh, superconducting nanowire single photon detector. Uh, this is even better detection was, was achieved with this because their quantum efficiency is very high for, for single photons, essentially taking uh, something that is superconducting and raising the temperature of it locally very tiny bits so that you get a pulse out. Uh, but I'll point out that that technology does require low temperature three or four Kelvin operation, whereas uh, um, avalanche photodiodes can operate at room temperature. So there we have a few options depending on exactly how we operate the system. And I'll finish up with the last few minutes with an outlook uh, for where, uh, what we think the important things to look for in, the, in this technology are in the, in the, in the near term and, and where we think it's going. So um, we'll mention 3D integration. I think that's very important for any qubit technology. Uh, all the experiments that have been done to date on all sorts of qubit modalities are essentially uh, lab experiments where you do whatever you can to kind of have the most access that you can with wires coming in from the sides, uh, essentially, so that you can connect everything easily, right? But if you want to make an array of things, then you're going to have to start thinking carefully about vertical integration. Uh, and 3D integration is, is a, a very natural way, both monolithic and heterogeneous uh, integration. We have um, uh, done a lot of monolithic integration of the top chip, as you can see up on the upper right, where we have these, these integrated waveguides, shown in the blue, and these grading couplers, the electrode structure, the insulator, which is light gray, and then avalanche photodiodes in red uh, in the silicon. Um, we can, we, we've also put electronics separately monolithically integrated, but we think in the long term, it might be best to use a better tech, the best technology you can for the electronics 
and then use things like through silicon vias, through substrate vias, to connect and bond these chips together where you've created the electronics chip in the best way that you can and the highest technology that you can uh, based on classical CMOS electronics on the bottom and then bond it to the, the top chip which has most of the, the novel quantum technology and requires slightly different fabrication and then connect everything in this sort of, uh, in this cross section you can see everything's vertically integrated and so I could then array things laterally to get the most uh, connectivity that I can. And so that requires very carefully thinking about materials but this heterogeneous approach means that the electronics part I don't have to worry so much, I can use kind of standard technologies. Uh, and then I just have two more slides. One is saying, uh, getting back to this clock approach, we have uh, an effort where we're working on uh, a trapped iron clock that is, uh, can be portable. And so utilizing all these technologies that I've described, even though they might be good for quantum computing and making things robust, they can actually make things smaller as well and be robust to vibration. And so using a, uh, uh, an on-chip array uh, as you can see sort of in the center there, which is uh, addressed via integrated photonics and has detectors on it, and then using chip, scale, chip scales lasers that we are also developing, I'm not really gonna describe in any detail, and um, uh, what's known as a frequency comb, which allows you to take that stability of the laser, which is used, which is the, whose stability is gotten from addressing ions, uh, and then actually count and turn it into uh, you know, an out, uh, a, time, a stable time base that you can output, that forms a clock. And if you can make all of that stuff chip scale, then it can be small, and it can be something that can go in space, for instance, to improve GPS uh, for next generation GPS, uh, for radar and communications, uh, as Will described, and also for fundamental physics studies, uh, things like looking for uh, ultralight dark matter. It turns out that if you have very good clocks and satellites, this would be a good way to, to, uh, to look for them. And the last thing I'll say is, I won't go through this in detail, but just to point out that these microfabricated traps and these integrated technologies uh, we think will be a, a game changer in the near term and through the academic national lab and industrial collaborations that we've, we've started to set up recently, uh, we've really been able to push this technology. Uh, I just wanna thank um, a lot of the people at MIT and at Lincoln Laboratory who have contributed to this uh, and uh, thank you all for your attention. Uh, I'd be happy to take some questions. Okay, first question is, when do you feel there will be error-corrected ion trap-based logical qubits? So we're actually on the cusp of that. Uh, there was a uh, publication from the University of Maryland group uh, just uh, I feel like about a month ago, essentially demonstrating uh, that you have a, uh, I think it was about 13 uh, trapped, ion, uh, trapped ions uh, qubits forming one logical qubit and essentially doing fault tolerant, uh, what's known as fault tolerant detection of errors uh, and at this point still not doing real time uh, updating of those errors, though it can be done with a trapped ion system. Uh, the trapped, as, as Will mentioned, the trapped ions are somewhat slower than some of the other technologies, which is a curse, but it's also a benefit. That means that you can actually feed back in real time, typically, uh, to, to correct things. And, and uh, a very basic uh, level, um, trapped ions have been, errors in trapped ions have been corrected in real time for many years now, but not with a so-called fault-tolerant error-corrected circuit. And the demonstration by Maryland is just about like just about there. And so I feel like it won't be long before we have one. Whether we have lots of error corrected trapped ion logical qubits, that's gonna take a little while because the next thing you wanna do is make another one and do a logical two qubit operation, which is essentially lots of two qubit operations between all these physical qubits in a fault tolerant way. And I think that's still a few years away because that requires getting a lot of this control technology to actually work in the systems which are the highest performing today, uh, which is, is not quite there yet, but I'd say pretty soon. Uh, next one, ions are sensitive to electric charge noise on the surface. What is the typical infidelity induced by this when you move ions? And what are the state of the art technology for solving this? Yeah, so this is a great question. I didn't get into all the noise sources. There are, there are plenty, pick your modality, and there, there are noise sources that you have to fight with. Trapped ions do have, uh, uh, they are positively charged, and so they are affected by electric field noise that comes from the surface of the chip or elsewhere. Um, the internal states are very well isolated from this because you think about it, it's a charged particle. If I put a uh, you know, voltage over here, it'll just move. That doesn't do anything to the internal state. So that, the decoherence in that case is very minimal 
but when it does affect things is when I'm doing those two qubit operations that I mentioned that utilize this Coulomb interaction. So if, if the ions are supposed to just be feeling each other to do a two qubit gate, but now they feel this other elect electric field noise, that really jostles them around and that can lead to do coherence. So they're subject to electric field noise when the gate is happening. The typical infidelity of that is at this stage for most experiments where we see, like the highest performing experiments where you see 99.9% uh, .9 gate fidelity, it's typically a few uh, in that last digit uh, that are due to uh, electric field noise heating. And it depends a lot on details like how big the trap is and exactly what the frequency of the, uh, that the, the ion is trapped with. But typically it is, a we see that it is kind of a limit right now, but it, it will be very much more a limit as we push down to maybe another you know, order of magnitude in uh, fidelity. And so how do we address that? There's a few ways. The noise that's coming from the surface, uh, unfortunately, we don't know what it's due to right now. It's kind of a research problem to figure out what it is. We know that it's coming from the surface, and we know that something's happening there. There's obviously, the surface is not perfectly controlled in general. You have uh, lots of other atoms that are sitting there and they can move around. Uh, they can also form dipoles that flip up and down. All these things can cause noise. It's not exactly, none of those is definitely it, <laughs> as far as we can tell though. If we vary the system parameters and measure things, they don't quite match, so we don't know exactly what it is. However, we do know that cooling the surface down helps a lot. Uh, and so we think that probably quantum computers based on trapped ions, while they don't have to be cryogenic, they probably, would, for the ions, the, the qubits themselves to function, we think that it is a good idea to cool them down. They don't have to be cooled down as much, like in a dilution refrigerator to, you know, milli, milli Kelvin, but a few Kelvin helps a lot. That's one way. Another way is picking materials that may be more well-ordered um, and then preparing them in that way, but that is still a subject of active research. Uh, next question is, what is the figure of merit of ion trapped QC? Is there typical, uh, are there typical characteristics compared with uh, superconducting QC? So uh, Will had a great um, comparison chart, I believe, which showed uh, coherence time uh, versus speed of a qubit modality. And what you can see is at the very highest part were the trapped ions, because they have very long coherence times. I mentioned minutes up to hours in some cases, the quantum, that the quantum coherence can be maintained. In a, in a trapped ion system. Uh, but they are quite slow uh, compared to uh, solid state systems because, in some sense, because of the fact that they're so well isolated from the environment. It's harder to reach in there and grab them and change them quickly. That's, that's helpful in keeping uh, you know, the effects of noise minimized, but that means that you can't affect them as quickly. So there have been uh, improvements in trying to speed up uh, quantum gates in trapped ions uh, by increasing laser intensity. And one of the potential advantages that I didn't mention of the integrated photonic technology is that you can make these very tight beams. And since the intensity that's important for speed in a trapped ion gate, if I can make a very small beam, I can essentially get, uh, with, for the same power, I should be able to have a higher intensity and thus a higher speed uh, without having to worry about that beam wandering around now because it's stable. Uh, in space. And so we think that that's a potential way to get faster operations. Um, other figures of merit are just how many qubits you can get uh, together, just like any qubit modality. And you know, as, a, as I showed with that arrayed technology, we're certainly working towards that. And um, I think that's the last question, so thanks very much.